stops, the place goes silent. <laughs> it's not supposed to be that. You're supposed to listen to the music. Once the music stops, you should all start talking again, you know? That's how it goes. Well, welcome and good morning. We have some sun early. If you were up real early, the sun was out. It was beautiful. They say it's going to rain, but I guess we need that too. So what can I tell you? That's just the way it is. Um, I have given this as worship leader. I figured out that you usually have an opportunity to uh, give a very short message. And I've only had three months to think about it. So I've had lots of time to mull it over in my mind. And uh, what's really interesting is that I had a message all designed and thought out. And then I went to my class reunion yesterday. It was uh, titled 55 plus one, which means that I graduated 56 years ago, which is hard to believe. Um, but anyway, the interesting thing is that while there, I ran into Lowell Yancey who graduated with me. And Lowell's father, if I got this correct, was a pastor in the church. Is that true? Okay. Um, so anyway, Lowell and I got to talking. Lowell lives in Ephrata, Pennsylvania now. He lived in New York City for 20 years. He spent three years in Vietnam as a missionary uh, doing good as opposed to what else was going on. Uh, but anyway, we got to, we, we talked about our time in school, uh, how we were a little naive going out into the world. Uh, we talked about kind of, he said he missed, I said, well, what do you miss about New York City? Because there's a big difference between New York City in Africa, Pennsylvania, and he said, well, I miss the diversity. <clears throat> and I said, well, okay, how do you think you, we were prepared when we went out into, you know, the world? And he said, well, he was, felt somewhat prepared as I did. I thought the school did a good job. I, and as we talked, I couldn't help but think when I was in school, everybody was different, obviously. But we had one underlying uh, thing that, that kind of brought us all together. And that was the fact that I can't think of anyone in our class that didn't believe, that didn't have faith, that didn't have hope, that didn't have love. They we all believed in God. Now, we didn't all believe the same way, probably, and we all had different rituals. If you were a Catholic, the ritual or how you believed in God was truly different from what was believed probably in this church. It was different than in the Methodist church, I know that, because I was brought up as a Methodist. Um, but we all had that core belief. And what's really interesting is that nobody thought anything about it. We didn't have any of those preconceived ideas that if you were Catholic, you were doing something wrong. Uh, or if you were a Mennonite, you were doing something wrong. It was just the fact that we all had that belief. And so I thought afterwards, I said, I wonder if that's still today, because we're a unique community. And I couldn't help but think, when I was president of the school board, and at a graduation, I had strategically placed myself in front of the cookies and punch. And this man came up to me and he wanted to thank me. He thanked me, and he didn't want to. He'd come up and shook my hand and said, listen, I just wanted to thank you. He said, you really have a nice school here, and so on and so forth. And so after we got talking, because I thought that was, a, no one else had ever come up and you know, said that, and he was a military person 
His daughter had graduated. She was a senior. They'd moved into the Beaver River School District in the late summer, I believe he said, if I remember correctly. And he said he was so pleased, and he was so nervous when he moved here because he said they, he had been in the military all of his life. His daughter had only had three or four or five years in one spot, and they packed up and they moved again. And he said it was so difficult for her to move in her senior year. So he said that the one thing that impressed him so much was the fact that from the day she walked into the front door of the school, she was accepted. Nobody made fun of her, which had happened to her in the past. Nobody uh, had anything bad to say. They just wanted to know who she was. Why didn't she come and do this? Why didn't she help with this? They'd help her with her homework. They'd introduce her to the teachers. They'd do whatever they could. And I couldn't help but think that if Jesus received a person, he definitely would have done exactly that. He would have in, invited them into his house. He would have fed them. He would have clothed them if they needed. It didn't matter to him what faith they were. It didn't matter to him what their skin color was. He was just there to help them and to make them feel welcome. And I think that's what we have in this community. We have that feeling of no matter where you come from, no matter what your story is, we still welcome people. And I'm not so sure that that is true in the rest of the world. I wish it was, but I'm really not sure it is. And all we can do is continue to live that life that we have. I think we're very fortunate and very lucky that we, in this area anyway, in our corner of the world, we have a tendency not to judge, uh, but to welcome people. So let us go to prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we are able to be here in worship. We also pray to you that you will help us not to be judgmental, that you will help us in this community to be welcoming, to take people into our lives, to do whatever we can for them. We pray this in your name. Amen. I was glad to see no one walked out. <laughs> so, um, let's see. The next thing we have is the worship team. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so blessed to come before you today and to just open our hearts in worship and to just stand before you and just sing your, your praise, your, your glory, your, your mighty, your holiness. And let us be reminded that we are of you, Lord. We are made in your image and that our life is to be an instrument of your work. And uh, just, to, just to be open to the, the possibilities, the nudgings, the, the, the whisper in the ear, you know, that is your plan for our lives, Lord. And just to just be open to uh, a life that is in your service. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. And if, uh, if you're able, please stand and join us.
Okay, announcements. There must be some announcements. Yeah, or good morning, this is Peter for the oversight team. Uh, a reminder of next Sunday potluck dinner after our service um, and a special meeting. On behalf, on behalf of the oversight team, I would encourage you to attend um, this, this meeting. We are going to talk a little bit about some ideas for leadership for this church family as we move forward. Uh, just ideas and thoughts that have come, come together through the oversight team and looking for input and, and your ideas and information along to go with that. So again, I encourage everybody to attend next Sunday. Uh, we'll see you after the church service or potluck and then the meeting. If you have any other questions, just talk to somebody on the oversight team and we can kind of give you a little more info. Any other announcements? Okay, next is prayer and praise. Do we have any? Just like to bring your attention to the beautiful bouquet that's sitting on the front table, and that is from the funeral of Ilona Schaefer on Friday, and the family wanted to share that in her honor and remembrance this morning. So thank you to the family for letting us see those beautiful flowers in your mother's memory. Also, I was talking to Jessica Zare this morning, and she asked that I just pass along some information regarding Elias. Jessica has left. She's on her way back to Pittsburgh to be with Elias. He has been approved to be on the list for another lung transplant, and he has not yet been approved through the insurance for all of that, so they're hoping that it all sinks together uh, very shortly. But one of the concerns that they have right now is this for Elias. He has been experiencing quite a bit of anxiety and a lot of questions and all those kind of things that go along with this critical situation and his health. So please pray for Elias's calmness and his peace as he's going through this. Also pray for Jessica as she travels and as she gets there to comfort him and bring him words of encouragement in Pittsburgh and another need that they will need to have, and they know this having gone through it before, they're gonna be needing to find housing following the transplant surgery, whatever that is, and it will be for short term, three to four months. So they are in the process of looking for available housing for them and their family, and, and so please just pray for Jessica and Elias, and all the many decisions and things that they are encountering at this time. Anyone else? I just wanted to thank um, uh, you all uh, for praying continually for my dad, um, Kenny Lydicker. The prayers I would ask um, to continue to praise. This time we have good news. Um, he actually got released from hospice this past week because he's doing so well and he can now walk uh, with his cane occasionally. Um, he's a little anxious to get going, so his wife is a little concerned he's gonna go too fast. Um, and But I just wanna praise you and as these new adjustments uh, go with this, um, then there's a new adjustments too that they would make. I, I thank you for share, sharing your prayers for our family over these months. Anyone else? Okay, let's go to prayer. Dear Lord, we ask that you be with the Schaefer family as they go through the trauma of losing their mother. We ask that you be with Elias and we praise the fact that he's on the list for another transplant. We ask though that you be with him and help to keep him calm and give him some peace. And we also ask that you be with his wife, Jessica, as she drives back and forth from here to Pittsburgh. 
We also give you praise for Kenny Leindecker, who was recently released from hospice. We ask that you be with him and continue to help him in his recovery and move forward. We ask that you be with Gerald Eaton, who is in the hospital, who has age probably against him. He is 96, but we ask that you be with him, comfort him, and stay with him during this time. We ask that you be with each and every one of us. We also ask that you be with the people in Ukraine as they continue their fight. And we just ask that you help all of us to lead a righteous life. Amen. And now the children are dismissed. This is something new we haven't done for some time. Children's church. So any kids can go with Paula and Pandora. And they will have children's church. They'll come back at the end of the service. Step up, Bailey. So this means the rest of us aren't children. They just want you to know that. We're no longer in that category. Um, next we have the offering. Let us pray. Lord, please accept these ties and rest assured that we will use these for the promotion of the good news that you have provided us. Amen. And since I'm still up here, and there's been no coup. Uh, I just want to take an opportunity to tell you that I really feel we're very lucky to have Ed as our pastor. And to let you know that I do get around to a number of different churches, not always at a best of times, God bless you. But I do get to talk to an awful lot of people and a, particularly a lot of other clergy. And Ed has a reputation that is impeccable. And I just want you to know that we're very lucky, very fortunate, that we have Ed as a pastor, and you can be very proud of that fact. Ed?
My eyes aren't what they used to be. <laughs> He's joining the rest of us here. <laughs> the shortest sermon I've ever heard Ed preach. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, the song I'm going to sing this morning is, uh, the title is Without Him, and uh, Malin Fever was the author of the song. I first heard the song and I bought a uh, gospel tape of uh, Josh Turner, and this song was on it, and I'd never heard it before, but somehow he has a way of having the song simple and meaningful. And this is a very simple song. Uh, as I sing it at the end, we're gonna, I'm going to ask if you would all join me with, on the chorus after I get done singing through the song. It's simple, you learn it very quickly as I go through it. And uh, it's just meaningful. Oops, wrong sharing that and 
Thank you, Gary, for the kind words that you shared. Very humbling to hear that, but I appreciate it very much. But it makes it easy being around such wonderful people. And so I really greatly appreciate all of you and what you've done for so many. I do send out a greeting and a welcome to each of you. And no, I'm not Susie, if you looked in the bulletin and are a little confused. Uh, she got in touch with me on Friday, and unfortunately, um, their family has not been feeling well, and, and so she needs to continue to try to teach. So I said, well, how about we flip-flop? And so she's going to bring the message next Sunday. I had a few notes started for the message today. So yesterday afternoon, I told Cheryl, I said, I better finish what I started. So you'll get what I, what I put together shortly. As mentioned last Sunday, and I mention again today because it kind of rolled into the week again, that this space, as I mentioned last week, this very space here has been used for multiple times of worship, just like last week. On Friday, as the flowers presented show, we were able to celebrate, and I say the same words that I used on Friday, the legacy celebration of life of Ilona Schaefer. And again, thank you, Schaefer family. And then yesterday, for a very unique and special opportunity, we had the opportunity to celebrate with Frank and Barb Corbett for their 50th anniversary and did a renewal ceremony right here in this ceremony. I'd never been a part of that, never had seen it, but it was a really, really neat experience and some of you were here yesterday and were able to witness that as well. And today, we are again able to celebrate. And I say that not tongue in cheek, but it's serious. This time is a celebration. And I can say that honestly that it is a celebration because not everywhere in this world are people able to do this. You mentioned the Ukraine and other people, places where there is such turmoil that people don't dare gather. So we are able to celebrate because we're able to gather. We're also able to accept the opportunity to be here. And we know that not everybody chooses that. But you made the choice this morning, so again, I say thank you for choosing to celebrate and worship. And I hope that as you come each Sunday, you can really sense that this is a time of worship and celebration. Well, as another school year begins, sorry kids, it has begun. Four days into it, 176 to go. I think you got about 41 weeks. But one down, all right? We're going to talk a little bit about learning this morning, and it brings me to the title of this, Developing an Attitude of Learning. And learning has an education, obviously, in our household has been a pretty vital part of, of our whole life experience. And so we've talked a lot about education and learning. I'd like to begin with a quote for you. And the quote goes like this, the capacity to learn is a gift. The ability to learn is a skill. The willingness to learn is a choice. <coughs> we all have that choice. To learn or not to learn. To stay where I am or to move forward with knowledge that I didn't have yesterday. Some people get left behind. But learning brings benefits. Each and every one of us, as I look around here, no matter what your age is, each of us have benefits because of learning. You know, for those of you that have gone through 11th grade, and here in New York State, I understand now how important this is, but if you're in 11th grade, you take US history, and you learn about the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and all of those things you better know because in June, you're gonna take a Regents exam. And that is one of the exams that you have to pass in order to move forward. In first grade, first graders have to learn what letters are all about. They begin that in kindergarten, I know that. But then they began putting those letters together to form words. And in first grade, then, the benefit of those letters coming together to form words is that they learn to read. They begin to put words together and form sentences. That's the benefit of learning to read. Twelfth graders, after 13, 14, counting pre-K now, after 14 years of preparation and all the things that you have learned, myriads of things that have gone on in your classroom, you benefit from your learning by receiving a diploma. That diploma goes with you for the rest of your life and takes you forward, whether it's into employment or into college or wherever it may be. As adults, 
we continue to benefit from our learning as well. If we learn in a job, we learn skills in our job, what do we get? Sometimes we get more money, sometimes we get a promotion, sometimes we get the opportunity to do something different because we've picked up a new skill. We learn how to strengthen relationships throughout our life. We continue to learn to strengthen relationships. If we don't, we don't benefit from relationships, we get left out. From the time you're little kids, you begin to develop relationships and you learn what it takes to have a friend. And if you're not kind to that friend, that friend's gonna find somebody else. So you learn what it takes and then you engage in that. We learn to age and to accept new years and new decades. Cheryl and I both started a new decade, and some of you did as well this year, I know. New decades. And if we don't learn, we become grumpy old gray hairs. I'm not looking at anybody specifically. There's a lot of gray out there. But if we don't learn to age and to move forward, we're going to be left just as grumpy old people that don't care about things, that don't know about things. And I'm not picking on anybody, because I know I can be that way. If we don't choose to learn, we get left behind. A couple decades ago, that was one of the things that came about politically, no child left behind. And we needed to buy into that. We still need to buy into that, no child left behind. And as children of God, we should really want to buy into that. We don't want to be left behind, so we have to continue to learn. Life is all about learning to solve problems. Each and every one of you, no matter your age, has had to learn how to solve a problem, whatever that problem may be. We also need to learn to nurture. We need to learn to love. We need to learn to forgive. As Christians, it's imperative that we develop an attitude of learning, an attitude of learning so much about so many things. Life changes. Society changes, cultures change, and as Christians, we must continue to be relevant. We need to be relevant in the moment, in the times. Thank you, Gary, for your opening. It goes right along with this. We are fortunate in this community, but cultures are different, and we need to learn in order to be relevant. We need to be able to know how to participate, how to be able to portray how to teach, how to educate, how to interact, all those things. If we don't, we might as well be sitting to the side. I want to go to some verses out of Proverbs, and Brad, guess what I forgot? My glasses. So I'll do my best. Brad usually reminds me on Sunday mornings, and he didn't this Sunday, Brad. <laughs> do my best. I'll squint. I get, I'll turn the light on brighter. Yeah, that helps out a little bit. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 15 says this. The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge. The ears of the wise seek it out. Then if we turn a couple pages to chapter 22. 22, beginning in verse 17. Pay attention and listen to the sayings of the wise. Apply your heart to what I teach. For it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have all of them ready on your lips so that your trust may be in the Lord. I teach you today, even you. Have I not written 30 sayings for you, saying, sayings of the counsel and knowledge, teaching you true and reliable words so that you can give solid and sound answers to him who sent you? Now, the writer, uh, Proverbs Solomon, and in these, it might have been a group of other wise individuals that accounted for some of those. But wise people continue to learn. And as I look around, I see a lot of wisdom here. As I look around right here, and a lot of the, those of you that will be listening, I know some of you individuals have eight or nine decades of experience. And we are blessed in this church family to have a lot of that, a lot of decades of experience right amongst our midst. And those life experiences that you've lived in those eight or nine decades, I know have taught you a lot, and you've learned along the way. You've been able to learn skills, teach skills, share skills, pass along wisdom. And for that, I truly say thank you. I say thank you as I look around and see some of those of you that are 
nearing another decade in the eights and nines. Consider the world 80 years ago. Consider the world 80 years ago, 1942, if, I'd done, if I've done my math correctly. 1942, some of you would have been here 80 years ago. Consider the huge, challenging experiences that you are going to have to come about in your lifetime. Think about all that you have learned since 1942. Consider the technology changes. Consider the educational changes. Consider the medical changes. Consider the travel changes. All of those things that you have learned in eight decades. And if you hadn't learned, you would have been left behind. We would have been left behind. For those of us that weren't here eight decades ago, we would have been left behind because you that were here have been able to help to teach us, help us to learn. A willingness to listen and learn and to accept the wisdom of others is so important. Choosing to learn is a wise thing. Sometimes the wisest words are spoken by children. Did you know that? Sometimes kids say the wisest things. You just got to pick it up and listen to them. Little kids will say things that adults sometimes think or they don't. Sometimes kids will ask a question about why something is done in a certain way. You better be prepared because their wisdom is going to be pretty relevant if we really think about it and take it seriously. You know, how often do I open my heart and my mind to learn from God? Do I do that? Do I open my heart and mind to learn from God? I open up my mind and listen to other people. Do I, do I do the same thing? A spiritual attitude of learning is so important for us. If we go to Psalm chapter 25, Psalm 25, verses 4 through 10. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them the way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. God desires that we look to him and we learn from him. That's why we're here this morning, to learn a little bit more, to hear a little bit more from God. An attitude each day is to wake up and say, show me and teach me today, God. Show me and teach me something new. And having the openness to do that. Here's a thought. Have you ever considered how wonderful it would have been to sit and learn from Jesus? Have you ever thought about that? We didn't have that opportunity, but can you imagine the disciples? Can you imagine the other hundreds of people who actually sat and listened to Jesus speak? In Matthew chapter 20, uh, Matthew 5, it's called the Sermon on the Mount for the next couple chapters. And Jesus is up on the mountain. He's talking to his disciples. He's been around crowds all the time. Can you imagine sitting on the mountain at the feet of Jesus and just listening to him? Listening to the words, learning from what he was going to say. Saying things like, blessed are the meek. They're going to inherit the earth. He wouldn't have just said that without explanation. Jesus used stories. He would have talked about the meek person and what that meant to be meek. And how a meek person would inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Jesus would have said, listen, you have to do as I have done. Show mercy to those people that you may not even like, that you may not agree with, that you may have totally different thoughts about. Show mercy. And then you'll be shown mercy. He would have also said at that same time as they're sitting at his feet, you've heard that it said that you should hate your enemies. But I want you to know something, my friends, he would say. Love your enemies. Pray for them. Lift them up. He would have said to them, 
Learn from me in a new way. Learn from me in a new way. Old things, they were there, but I'm here with some new thoughts, some new ways of looking at things. And as I mentioned, he told stories. He captured the meanings of things in the stories he told, from the experiences he had. He talked in parables. Those are stories, really, about situations, situations that he may have encountered, whether it's about sowing seeds or healing people or bringing people back to life, whatever it may have been. He captured the attention of people by telling them stories. Those of you that have sat in classroom know that when a teacher illustrates with something that's relevant, with a story, you usually perk up and you'll listen. You know, I can only imagine Jesus having to do that with his disciples, and I, I know I really run down poor Peter. But Peter was one of those guys, I'm sure he said, would have said, Peter, listen to me. Listen again to me, Peter. I know you're picking those flowers right there and watching the ants run around under the rocks. Pay attention, I got a message for you. But that's how it is in a classroom. For those of you who've never taught in a classroom, there's usually one or two kids that need to be reminded, and you say their name about 10 times during a lesson. That's to capture their attention. That's what God does for us. He wants from us. He wants our attention. Developing an attitude of learning means that you're humble enough to say, I don't know. You're humble enough to say, I don't know what that means. You know, we can probably all remember individuals who we've said, they're just such a know-it-all. They seem to think they know everything about everything. They have an answer for something before you even ask the question. We've all been around individuals like that, I'm sure. They have an opinion, they have an answer. They think they're smarter than we are, that kind of thing. Those kind of people used to rub me the wrong way, especially it came from the pulpit. People that had very few questions when I was younger really kind of made me stop and think, they, have, they don't have any questions, they have all the answers, but what about the questions? Religious leaders, past and present, have really been at fault for that to stand in front of people seemingly to say, I have the answers. I don't think that's the way Jesus intended it for us to be as leaders. There's another quote that I saw that said, leaders always have to be learning. <coughs> Leadership always has to be learning. Nobody ever attains all knowledge, that's God. God's the only one that's known it all. We all have to continue to learn. Well, as I turn my page to the last page of my notes, not too long today, Jeff. I'd be remiss if I didn't today acknowledge the date that it is. Today is September 11th. 21 years ago, I'm sure each and every one of you as an adult probably remembers where you were that morning. September 11th, 2001. I remember sitting in a meeting that day and somebody came and plucked the principal out of the meeting um, and we all figured that something, probably with a student or whatever, had gone wrong. Then we quickly began to hear about things as soon as we left that meeting into the hallway and into the classrooms where televisions were turned on. Yes, they had televisions back then, not uh, smart boards. But we began to see the images on the screens time and time again. So I'm sure we all remember that. And today is one of those days that we do have to think about the lives and the people that were affected by that tragedy. But again, as in so many instances of senseless taking of lives, of human life, we can learn from those experiences. From that tragedy has risen knowledge. Cheryl and I visited Ground Zero there a year or so after saw the big hole, and now that has been filled up and restored into something of a, of a masterpiece. But in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of tragedy, people will run to those who will comfort and protect. Others will run to people to comfort and protect. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking people have learned that, the importance of embracing other people the importance of going out and making sure somebody that's hurting is touched in a new way. Irregardless. And this is what I say, irregardless of what we've, and this is something we've learned. And those images that followed, the newscasts that followed that tragic day of 9-11, we saw people running. Running into arms of people they didn't know.
shouldn't be emotional. <clears throat> Simply giving help. They didn't care what they looked like, what they smelled like, whether they were the same ethnicity, the same age, gender, it didn't matter. They were running into each other's arms. I hope we've learned something. We've learned that in the middle of crisis, people can unite, can unite, can unite with a tenacious spirit of wanting to do the right thing. As Christians, I think it's so important that we do that. As Christians, we should be the ultimate example of rebuilding and recovering, regaining strength and stability. We should be the ones that model that every single day. Today in our country and in our world, we know there's division. We know that. We know there's division. We know there's separation that remains. And we need to be humble enough to say, I have more to learn. We need to be humble enough to say, God, teach me today. Teach me something new. Show me what is out there. People need to be, people need people, but people need to share and re-experience God in a new way. And that's up to us to help to teach that. I'd like to close by reading 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. It says this. This is what God desires. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forevermore. To grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we haven't learned anything in all these years of circumstances, we need to learn that Jesus is about grace. And he wants us to learn that, accept that as part of our knowledge. To him be the glory both now and forevermore. Amen. Romy? grace and mercy. Uh, I think this song is very appropriate to share as a closing song. Please stand if you care to.
perfect choice, Romy. Thank you very much. I apologize for getting a little emotional there. I'm not sure why that hit me at that moment. But again, we all have that opportunity as we go forward this week to learn a little bit more about what it means to be a Christian and have God show us what we need to do. Next Sunday, Susie will bring the message that's in your bulletin for today. So we look forward to that, unless she calls me Friday. And who knows what you'll get then. <coughs> Next Sunday again, potluck, following the, uh, the worship time. Make sure everybody comes prepared for that. And then following that, there will be a special meeting. We don't anticipate that meeting to be a long meeting, but we just encourage everybody to be a part of that discussion. And I'm going to say this, the youth, if you would, in about five minutes after the worship service, if you just meet up here, we'll just talk a little bit about the afternoon. Let's pray. God, we just are so grateful. We're so grateful that you have patience with us as we learn. That you want us to learn. That you want us every day to get up and say, show me, teach me. Open my eyes and my heart to learn. God, I just ask that no matter our age, whether we're a school-aged child or 90-plus-year-old child, whatever we are, that we all continue to develop an attitude of learning. Amen. Amen. Go now in peace. Go now in peace.